So I'm here with Nicholas Sullivan and you wrote The Blue Revolution, Harvest Hunting, Harvesting and Farming Seafood in the Information Age. Thanks so much for being here with me today. Thank you. Great to be with you. <laughs> yeah. So let's start with um, why you wrote the book, where the book came from, your personal relationship with the book. Right. Well, I started writing the book. I had been writing about business and technology for 20 years. And then I started getting involved with <clears throat> business and technology in developing countries. Mm. And I did a lot about cell phones and mobile money, which brought me into financial inclusion. So I did a lot of work in different countries oh. on, on financial inclusion and getting more people into banking systems, which obviously has nothing to do with fishing. But through that work and with USAID and other groups that were working in these countries, Food security is obviously a huge issue. And in many parts of the world, um, fish is a huge part of food security because um, fish protein, protein from fish is number two, you know, source after milk in many parts of the world. And <clears throat> not only for food, but also livelihoods. There are a lot, hundreds of thousands of people who are fishing for a living. Mm -hmm. So, um, and of course, over the last 30 years, so I live in um, outside New Bedford, Massachusetts, which is the top value fishing port in the U.S. So I've been following the ups and downs of the fishing industry through the lens of New Bedford, but also reading the you know, dire stories of overfishing, illegal fishing, um, uh, environmental disasters from farm fishing. And so I, I started to wonder where are the fish going to come from to feed the world? I mean, fish consumption is doubling, has doubled in the last 30 years. Population, world population is continuing to grow. More people are eating more fish. So um, that's what led me to, to write the book. And I had written about fishing in the 70s when I was in college. So I was kind of coming back to an old um, uh, topic that I really was felt close to. Um, but as far as where are the fish are going to come from to feed the world, the answer to that is pretty clearly from farmed fish. <laughs> I mean, now it's over 50% of the fish consumed is farmed. Um, and the majority of that is freshwater. So um, but anyway, I started out with a global lens. and um, But then I was writing the book during the pandemic, pretty much. So I was not doing a lot of traveling. And I kind of pulled it back to New England Northeast where I've grown up and and which is what you know one of the old you know fishing um uh hot spots of of the world really you know the Gulf of Maine and George's Bank and so forth um so that's what got me into it and that's how I um kind of reeled it in and um I um the other thing I realized I quickly realized that farm fishing was the basic answer to the question, where are the fish going to come from? But I also realized in talking to people as I was researching the book that most people, most Americans, most lay people, uh, most fish lovers or, or fish haters have negative perceptions of fish mm -hmm. because of the overfishing and because of the environmental impact, you know, all the stories that we've been hearing. And I was getting a different take as I was doing the research and thinking things have actually changed quite a bit in the last 20 years. And I think people's perceptions are based on stuff that was happening in the 90s, really, or early 2000s. So um, I was really trying to, A, figure out how to sustainably, sustainably maintain production at current levels or increase it even to keep up with world, world population growth, but also to kind of change people's perceptions of the industry. Mm -hmm. um, so those became my kind of goals as I was researching and writing. So at CFS, I think a lot of people who follow us are probably very not pro farmed fish. Mm -hmm. um, myself, I'm a bit skeptical in, and I read your book and I found your uh, case studies and examples, interesting and compelling and different in thinking about it. Um, I think something that was hard for me though, was 
And I've, I've experienced fishing across the world. I've had the privilege to study abroad in a lot of different countries and learn about food in different contexts. And um, I think there was a line in your book about comparing growing the fish in the farm, the way that you can farm fish and like sort of keep them like incubated in a space before mm. selling them as comparable mm. to like picking an apple and putting it in like one of those refrigerators before you put it out to the market, that kind of thing. Right. Oh, I know. I know what you're talking about. So that was with the Barramundi probably yes. Yes. in Western yes. Massachusetts because yes. they're selling live fish. Right. Yes. Selling exactly. Barramundi, which is a kind of subtropical bass-like fish from Australia and Asia. And, um, yeah. And they do that. They're selling live fish to basically Chinese Asian markets in Toronto, New York, Boston. So they're shipping fish in water yeah. to keep them live and so they can sell them live. Right. That's probably where that came from. Yeah. I, so I think for me, what I'm getting to is mm. that I have a hard time personally uh, as like a very sensitive animal lover or mm. culture lover thinking about animals and eating animals as like a commodified product mm. which is sort of essentially what a farmed fish is going to be because it's not the point is not for the fish you know to like live out its life cycle in the natural world and whatever the point is to grow the fish so that we can eat it you know and so I guess my curiosity comes from um how do you approach that how do you think about that well i mean it's really what happened on land right because we yes. used to eat bison in the u.s in the, the you know the 19th century and we hunted the bison out of existence and and so now we've gone to you know raised beef and chickens and pigs and so forth as has most of the world, right? There's very little wild food left. Um, yeah. So um, I kind of see it as equivalent to that, really. And then if you start going down that path, then you start to think, well, um, raising seafood is much more efficient than raising land-based animals in terms of land use and water use and yeah. food. And it's much, much more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, fish you know they don't have to thermal regulate like you know animals do um they don't have to fight gravity the way animals do so they, they're much more efficient uh um, converters of food into protein than land-based animals i see so then so, you because there's a lot of virtue to then farm fish as yeah. opposed to farmed land animals lesser of two well, so that's kind of how i think about it really yeah yeah, no, that makes sense. Well, so when you were researching more and more and coming to the conclusion that farmed fish was the answer um, to ensuring people continue to eat fish and we don't have to worry so much about losing stocks and overfishing and whatnot, what, um, how did you come to that conclusion? Um, just by looking at the um, the UN and the food and um, um an agriculture organization part of the UN does an, an annual kind of global fisheries report. Mm -hmm. And they've got this incredible, well, not incredible, just a basic chart that they do every year that shows all the wild caught fish in the ocean and on in freshwater and all the wild farm, I mean, all the farm fish in freshwater and marine water. And you can just see that aquaculture, the farm fish is going up. And it's, you know, more than half of the total fish production of, you know, 180 million tons or per metric tons per year, more, more than 50% is farmed, which is not to say, back to your point, that I think that all farm fish is being farmed right, because there are definitely parts of the world, I, mean, I think in general, things are a lot better than they were in the 90s, when the Norwegian salmon farming was taking so much heat for the near shore, you know, and the escapement and the disease and the antibiotics and everything. I mean, those days are definitely gone, but still I think shrimp farming in Southeast Asia is pretty dicey in many cases. And, um, and um, even maybe some salmon farming in some parts of the world, but I think the salmon has been really pretty well cleaned up. 
And um, I think the whole idea of kind of quote unquote industrial farming is maybe a bit of a misnomer because that does conjure up all that, those negative connotations of antibiotics, disease, escapement, um, uh, uh, breeding with um, kind of um, other stocks and so forth. Um, but there are, you know, and one of the problems with the U.S. in terms of, well, just talk about the U.S. for a sec. So the U.S., the 60 percent of the seafood that Americans eat is farmed salmon and shrimp from the other side of the world or canned tuna from all over the world. So we have more um, ocean territory than any country in the world except for France. But. 60% of the seafood we eat comes from the other parts of the world. So there's something wrong with that picture. And to, when you import fish into the US, the only requirement um, in terms of labeling is country of origin. So you really don't know how it was farmed unless you actually know the the brand and the, and the country. Like Faroe Islands, I think is really, really good. Iceland is really reliable and, but you know, product of Thailand, product of Vietnam, not so reliable in terms of sustainable farming techniques. And there's more industrial practices there and wiping out mangrove swamps, swamps and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a complicated issue, obviously, but there are many aspects to it. And to just kind of, I, I think, say it's all bad, <laughs> uh, I don't think is true at all, because I think a lot of it is actually really good. And the other thing is that I think the majority, at least the Nature Conservancy, would say that the majority of farmed seafood in the world, not just the U.S., but globally, is um, shellfish and seaweed, both of which are restorative to the ocean and um, don't use any f fresh water or fertilizer or feed or anything, right? So it's very efficient to grow and good for the ocean. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people really think about that. They just think you know, and they're because they're thinking about the horror stories about fin fish farming. Mm. So uh, there are many different aspects and angles and ways to think about it. And obviously, there are still changes that need to happen and improvements. Uh, like one, for example, that really bothered a lot, m marine biologists in particular, and then environmentalists was the amount of fish feed used to feed farm fish, like forage fish, menhaden and anchovies and small forage fish. And back in the 90s, it was like five pounds of fish meal, fish oil from all little fish to create one pound of fish. But now it's more like one pound of fish feed to for one pound of fish. And a lot of it is the percentage of fish meal and fish oil is like down from 70% to 30% or, or even that's an old number. So it's lower than that. And there are alternative, you know, single cell protein, insect, black in, black soldier, insect larvae, um, ethanol and methanol that are converted by bacteria into proteins. They're all, and soy and corn, which are not so great because you then you got to use land, you know, to grow them. But there are a lot of alternative protein foods now being used in aquaculture. So, um, that's just another issue that has really changed in the last 20 years and particularly in the last 10 years with there's like a big biotech movement in Silicon Valley to grow out, you know, single cell pro proteins. And so it's just another kind of example about how people's perceptions based on what's happened in the past are not necessarily relevant today. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure um, people who will listen to this, there are many of us who are very skeptical mm -hmm. about the biotech industry, but what uh -huh. I, yeah, that's probably a reason for that, but yeah. <laughs> but what I appreciate about your book was I felt like it was very well balanced in mm -hmm. sort of addressing all the different solutions and issues. And even the, you know, the concept of we're not using all the fish that we could be using, like, and providing mm -hmm. examples what's happening in Iceland and entrepreneurship. And I just feel like you laid out um, what was going on in a very sort of 
uh, what felt pretty unbiased to me in terms of these are the potential solutions, these are the things that could work, these are also the issues and concerns that are present too. And I think that was really helpful rather than feeling like, like we have to find solutions to big problems that are perfect, you know, like that's not really going to work. Right. Right. And of course my approach really to it was not as, um, as an advocate for th this industry or this part of this industry. Um, but as a journalist, really, just to see, see what I was really trying to find out what was going on. I was trying to kind of answer my own questions about, is it really as bad as it seems or as bad as we hear it is? Or is there hope for the future? <laughs> That's all I really wanted to know. Yeah. And of course, one thing about, you know, where are the fish going to come from to feed the world by focusing on New England and U.S. or Northeast, you know, Atlantic coast um, doesn't really answer the question about feeding the world, obviously. Um, but it does give, I think, a lot of kind of models for ways to do things, right? Because the U.S. fisheries, while not perfect, and, you know, the kind of the demise of the cod is one big kind of black eye, um, U.S. fisheries are really a model for the world and very well managed. And um, so, and people don't, people think U.S. fisheries are terrible, terrible too, you know, so... Uh, <laughs> But it really is not, it's not how the rest of the world perceives us. And I don't, I don't think it's true, really. Yeah, no, I too, I'm, I have limited background in when it comes to um, fish and aquaculture knowledge hmm. from Arizona. <laughs> we're landlocked. There's, we're not eating, you know, oysters all the time or anything like that. So I, I, eat fish a little bit, but I don't know. Mm, I don't think that much about what's happening in New England and what that experience mm. is. Um, and so I appreciated how in depth you went into it because I also hadn't necessarily thought about the impact of dams on fish stocks and just. That was really an eye opener for me too. Yeah, <clears throat> that, was, that was really amazing just because the, and it really, the connection between the land and the ocean and what goes on the land really has a huge impact. And of course, environmentalists know this, right? The runoff and the nitrogen load and everything, but um, it's pretty dramatic. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So since writing the book, um, what have you seen? Have you learned anything new or anything interesting? You mean that has happened since the book? So the book came out in um, <clears throat> spring 2022, so a little more than a year ago, but I actually finished writing it in 2021. So oh, two years ago, really, I finished writing yeah. it. Um, yeah. Well, you know, the, the big holy grail for um, uh, fish farming has been, um, well, A, shellfish and kelp, which is taking off like, crazy um and moving farms on to land for recirculating aquaculture tanks or to offshore so that they're not you know uh impacting the near shore estuaries or near shore environment mm -hmm. and both those things have really taken off in the last couple of years the land-based stuff there's you know as far as I, there at one point i think there was going to be a salmon farm in arizona i don't know if it's happened or not not, but there was talk about it, you know, big, um, I mean, there's a big one in Wisconsin, there's one in Indiana, there are three going in Maine, there, um, and there's eel farms in Barramundi and Branzino and trout and steelhead. So there's tons of land-based farms. So, and that actually answers a lot of the kind of um, questions that people have about, you know, negative environmental impacts because there's no really use of fresh water you just recirculate what you have and and uh, is very controlled they can't escape they can't impact other populations and so forth uh, and the other thing is the offshore farming which is you know deeper waters and federal waters which is more than three miles offshore and there have been a lot of um court cases, as you well know, because the um, Center for Food Safety has been part of them, a lot of them, and um, they've basically gone against 
most um, people wanting to start farms in the Gulf of Mexico, coast of California, um, off, off of Long Island. Well, actually, there haven't been lawsuits here, but they just haven't been permitted. Um, meanwhile, there are other parts of the world, like Norway and China in particular, are really going uh, full bore on offshore farming. So the other the other kind of thing to think about with aquaculture. So if you think that 40, 60% of what we eat is imported fish, right? Um, there's a, we have a huge trade deficit. I don't know what their number is, but it's like $18 billion or something. And we have the most ocean territory in the world after France. And if the rest of the world is going full bore onto offshore ocean farming, where is that? I mean, that's just going to kind of, that gap is going to widen. And um, the other thing I really saw happening during the pandemic, and I think it has expanded a lot since then, is the connection between, and this is very positive, I think, in terms of affecting production, the connection between consumers and producers, because the fishing business has, has traditionally been opaque, non-transparent. You don't know where this fish comes from, right? It's just a block of white fish or something, you know, with, wrapped in a brown paper bag. And you really don't know where it comes from. And uh, but now there's a with there's community supported fisheries. Um, there are um, fisheries that are local catch organizations that are your local fishermen. So people are getting to know their local fishermen, and these organizations now with fresh flash freezing techniques can ship fish all over the place. And um, and with these QR codes that are telling stories about the boat and the fishermen and the type of um, gear, rod and reel versus trawl net or whatever it is, I think really is changing the um, equilibrium in the favor of the consumer because producers are going to want to do right by the consumer that they're interacting with. And um, so I think that pressure, that's upward pressure or outward pressure from the consumer who, you know, has gone through this with land-based support, community-supported agriculture and, um, you know, bioregional and local food and all that stuff. So that same stuff is happening with fish, except that with fish, you can flash freeze it and lock in the nutrients and the freshness, which you can't do with a bag of lettuce, a head of lettuce, right? Or a bag of peas or something. Yeah. So that's another huge development, I think, that... Um, is really going to um, be a game changer, or are, are you going to? And the fish farms are bringing in. So you have this image of fishermen as being old white males, grizzled white males, right, and old boats and stuff. Cowboys, but yeah. Cowboys <laughs> of the sea, yeah. That's what I used to call them. And um, they, um, the the new people coming into the industry now, mostly through farming, are younger. A lot of uh, women, uh, multicultural, uh, uh, trained scientists or born entrepreneurs, they're not hunters. You know, it's a totally different mindset. So they are approaching their production with a totally different lens. I mean, they're trying to get investment from people and they know that investors are very careful about who they're putting money into. Um so they're not just kind of hunters going, give me a boat and let me go. And with no regulations, no nothing, you know? So that is really uh, a sea change, so to speak. Yeah. Um, in your book, there's a story about procurement at Harvard and, mm, yes. that, you know, creating that relationship from the, uh, what's the right word? Uh, well, the local fish, they were trying to get away from the frozen Chinese or a tilapia or something, right? Yeah. The students, no, it, you see, the students demanded that. Yeah, I no, that was, I love that story because it is also a reminder of how um, powerful and impactful institutions can be in their purchase. Right. How they can also great, great point. Those great point. Yeah. And, and now the, um, and I, I want to follow up on that, but just the way I think of it, the, um, Cambridge Ringe and Latin Public High School. Um, there was a story in the Boston Globe a couple of weeks ago, serving kelp balls, <laughs> you know, in their cafeteria. 
they look like little meatballs, but they're made out of kelp. Yeah. Um, anyway, so that story, that's um, Jared Auerbach um, from Red's Best in Boston. Harvard um, uh, Dining Services went to him and said, we want local fish. Our students want local fish. What do you got? And he tried, he said, well, it, it, it varies all the time. It depends what's coming in because he goes around and buys from all these docks. And um, he finally just made a deal with them, which they accepted. You know, I can get you X number of pounds, X number of days a week at X price per pound, but I can't guarantee the type of fish because it varies by what's coming in. And it took him about two years to work out a contract, but um, they worked it out. And uh, it's great. Now he's done it, I think, at Cornell and several other universities. And yeah, no, the institutions do have a lot of power. Um, which is, which also, you know, like supermarkets, Costco and Whole Foods, they're demanding um, all this traceable, you know, fish. That They're not going to buy fish without knowing where it's coming from. And the FDA... <clears throat> has ruled that by 2025, all fish coming into this country or sold in this country has to be tech. There must be tech enabled transparency, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily a blockchain, but probably will end up being blockchain or IBM food trust or something. Mm -hmm. And part of that is to, well, it's a, the food safety angle. Where is the shrimp coming from and how was it raised? But also, is this fish illegal? Is it caught by pirates with long lines in the middle of the ocean where they're hooking turtles and birds and whales and dolphins and things? Or is it, you know, verified fish coming from a verified producer? I yeah, mean, an incredible producer. Yeah, I didn't know that, which is quite uh, important given that the U.S. is the largest importer uh, for, for sure. I'm pretty sure yeah. that's true. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, Nicholas, thank you so much for your time. I hope that people read your book, especially if you're curious about the future of fishing and you're just wondering, you know, what are the options? <laughs> there's, hmm. there's so much richness in this book. There are so many different ideas. It's extremely thought provoking. So thanks so much for your time and for your book. Well, thank you very much for uh, having me on. And um, I'm glad we got to talk about some of these kind of contentious issues because they are contentious and that they would need to be solved yeah. because the world population is growing and needs more fish. Yeah. So thank you very much.